from the lake. Just make some dumb choices. Not the most politically correct. <laughs> but why do I have. Uh, uh, that was found nope. next to this chair. Oh, okay. So it's yeah. a debit card. Yes. So I could use it if I could figure out the pin number. You could, but I assume he's in your previous class. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll, uh, I'll make sure the secretary gets this. She can turn it on that. Cubs. That's Chicago. Hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Classic album of the week um, is December's Children. Um, this is uh, Rolling Stones. Um, they are on tour right now. Uh, they, uh, well, I, and Mick Jagger had some health problems, and I guess they delayed some of the shows, but... Uh, but they are uh, out on tour still. Um, this is uh, probably the, the song that you, you almost all will have heard of, is Get Off My Cloud. Um, so uh, if you haven't heard that, then you, you really should. Um, so anyway, so that's one of the, uh, you know, one of the great Rolling Stones tunes. Uh, Brian Jones was still with them at this point. Uh, he ended up, uh, Dying, uh, he was found uh, drowned in a swimming pool. Um, uh, very similar situation that Keith Moon uh, of The Who uh, was their drummer, and he ended up uh, dying very young as well. Um, so anyway, uh, you, should, uh, uh, you, you should really uh, take a listen to uh, December's Children. This one's in menorah, so pre-stereo. Um, I also noted that it's got 99 cents is what I paid for it. <laughs> All right. Um, Professor Steele is going to be, what do I do with that thing? Yeah. Um, Professor Steele is going to be speaking on the 16th, which I believe is Tuesday, at uh, 7 o'clock in lane 124, um, the American Chemical Society and Classic Liberal Organization. He's going to be speaking on the Green New Deal. Um, so if you're interested at all in, uh, in the Green New Deal or um, in uh, climate change or whatever, he's going to be talking about that. Um, also, uh, at 8 o'clock, uh, and I will remind you this on Monday, at 8 o'clock there's going to be a Arthur Brooks uh, documentary. Uh, he used to be head of the American Enterprise Institute, a uh, very interesting guy. Um, uh, but anyway, he's, um, that, that documentary is going to be shown at 8 o'clock, I think, on, on Tuesday as well. Uh, but I'll give you some more detail on that. On that. All right. Um, last time we were talking about this period, 1450 to 1750, and the institutions that developed during that period. Uh, and we noted that if you were uh, in the Sudan, uh, and you decided that you didn't want to have your people live like refugees, uh, then you would say, okay, we, you know, have read Mises' liberalism, and we know that the only way to create wealth for the masses is to uh, move to market capitalism. Uh, but if you were to do that, you would have to develop these institutions that developed in the West, because the West didn't just like show up at market capitalism, right? This Hayekian social evolution that we gradually got to market capitalism. Uh, but as part of what happened in the West was the development of these institutions. And although you won't have to uh, invent them like they did in the West, uh, they have to be available. Uh, and we, we talked about the uh, uh, idea of the legal system that gives uh, predictable results. We said that one of the um, characteristics that you talked about on the second midterm uh, that Hayek said that you needed to uh, have a government that minimizes coercion uh, would be that it be predictable. Um, we said that uh, you developed a system of credit and banking. You didn't need credit and banking in the period 900 to 1450 uh, because you, in this feudal period, I didn't need to borrow lots of money to do anything. Uh, Whereas, if you're going to outfit ships that we were talking about, this is the era of trade, right? And we talked about if you're going to outfit ships, then you'll get more ships being outfitted if you don't have to just have people who are rich enough to be able to buy the ship and buy all the materials that you're going to ship, that, you know, that all the product that you're going to try to sell. If you could spread that out, 
where some people would loan the money uh, and then you could uh, 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 undertake the purchase of the ships and stuff for the money that was lent you, um, then you're going to get more economic activity that way. So we develop the idea of credit and banking when it needs to come into existence. Um, we also talked about that uh, insurance markets developed over this period. We gave the uh, story of, uh, of uh, Beauty and the Beast, the book Beauty and the Beast, and the fact that her father uh, clearly didn't have insurance. Um, and that would, uh, the uh, insurance allows for a spreading of risk, so you can get more people willing to ship stuff from point A to point B, but they don't have to undertake both the risk of the market transaction and the risk that something's going to happen to the uh, happen to the ships. Um, we also talked about uh, there was a movement towards again predictability, only this time in taxation. That is, I have a taxation system uh, which is predictable. You know what the tax is going to be. Uh, not you don't have stuff just being uh, appropriated uh, whenever the government needs revenue to do something. So we mentioned that in Venezuela, uh, they don't have that, right? In Venezuela, they just expropriated the oil refineries of uh, foreign countries. And so what happens is ExxonMobil is not going to open up an oil refinery in Venezuela uh, until you get a government and where you have these institutions where uh, you have a set tax structure and the government isn't just out uh, uh, appropriating stuff. Um, and then we talked, finally talked about the institution of private property rights. That um, you, if you're going to have trade, then I need to know that you have the, oh, that you own the property. If you're, if you're going to buy a car from someone, then you're not going to buy the car if you don't know that it's their car that they're selling you. So what do we have? We have title. I don't know if you ever bought a car, uh, but if you've ever bought a car or you will buy a car, one of the things that'll happen is you'll have to go to the Secretary of State's office uh, and you'll have to show that this was their title, the person that gave it to you. Um, and if you were to get a loan for the car, then the lending agency would want to make sure that there, you had clear title to the car, the person that you were buying it from had clear title to the car. Same with a house, if you were to buy a house. So these transactions wouldn't occur in the absence of property rights. Um, and we, you know, we had that Mises talked about property rights as being the key to civilization. It was one of the foundations of liberalism. Uh, Hayek said that property rights create this sphere of free action uh, in which you can act according to your own plan. Uh, and so, the, in the West, what happened is this clear, uh, uh, clear definition of property rights, this clear uh, institution of property rights developed. And why does it develop? You don't need it if this or 1100, but you need it if you're going to have all sorts of trade going on. And this was, uh, this was the era of trade. Um, the, the next institution that developed uh, was the idea of the firm distinct from the individual. Is a firm distinct from uh, the individual. And again, this develops when you need it to develop. Um, if this were 1400, um, there are 1300, uh, let's say Geppetto uh, is, got, is making clocks, right? And Geppetto wants to expand his, uh, his uh, clock business. Uh, he wants to borrow some money to do that, right? Um, if I'm going to loan money to Geppetto, I'm going to know that Geppetto's going to pay me back. But now, I suppose I know Geppetto always pays back his loans, etc. Um, here's the problem. Geppetto is 70 years old and he wants to take out a 20-year loan. Okay? And this is 1350 or whatever, and you know that the life expectancy is not anywhere near that. So, would I loan money to Geppetto? And the answer is probably not. I, I got to guess whether Jimmy Cricket or Pinocchio would end up paying me back. Um, I just know what's going on with Pinocchio with uh, with Geppetto, so I'm not going to lend the money. But I need lending to happen in order to have this expansion of trade that we've got going on. So what do we need to do? We need to invent something where I can loan it for a long period of time, and it's not just to an individual. So we developed the idea of the firm being distinct from the individual. 
Um, and uh, for example, uh, we have the uh, Dutch East India Trading Company. Um, if we, uh, you know, uh, in Pirates of the Caribbean, um, uh, Elizabeth uh, has uh, two love interests. Uh, one is Will, um, but the other is, I forget his name, but he's a captain, right? And he's the captain of a ship, and that ship belongs to the Dutch East India Trading Company, okay? So he doesn't own the ship. It's not his ship. Some entity owns the ship. It's the Dutch East India Trading Company that owns the ship. Uh, and so we know that if you're watching Pirates of the Caribbean, it must be in this period 1450 to 1750, right? Because if it were prior to that, you wouldn't have, if this were the Middle Ages, you wouldn't have the concept of the Dutch East India Trading Company. But if you're gonna have this expansion of trade, what we do, which we do, is that we have to think up of a something, a firm distinct from the individual, and what can it can do? Um, it can own property, um, it can uh, hire people, uh, it can enter into contracts, uh, it can do all those things that individuals can do. So it acts like an individual, um, but it is not the same thing as an individual. And why is that? Because we need this thing to show up, and it does show up. Uh, and just as we needed uh, the credit and banking to show up, it shows up, and there's a need to do it. There's no need for credit and banking in 1100. But 1450 to 1750, you need this. You need, uh, you need this, these uh, uh, companies, the, this idea of a firm distinct from an individual to happen because if we're going to have all sorts of international trade, we, uh, we need to have something that we can lend to over uh, lengthy periods of time. Uh, another one is you, you know, the Hudson Bay Company. Right? And what these original companies, these tend to be um, chartered monopolies in trade. That is, if I am, the, the, the way, remember that the, um, the kings lost their ability, at least in Great Britain for sure, uh, the kings lost their ability to tax uh, without consent of the parliament. So the king started looking around for ways to generate revenue from trade. That was one way to do that. One way to do this, we said you could impose tariffs, but one thing that happened was they said, okay, we will sell you this monopoly of trade over the area of the, uh, the East Indies, right, um, and India, and as a private company is settled, much of India was this private company. Um, and so they had a monopoly over trade. Uh, the Hudson Bay Company, what do they have? They're the only ones that can operate in this area, so they have a monopoly on it, and they pay for this charter. So that's what the companies look like. That's what these firms look like. We'll see that when we get to the 19th century, when we get into the factory system, we'll talk about it at the end of class today, you need an entity which does more than just trade. It can do all sorts of stuff, right? Because you need to have some entity that can do manufacturing. Uh, you don't need that in this period. So the first way that we think of a firm distinct from an individual is a firm that's going to be engaged in trade. Because we said that's what's going on in this period. That's where the innovation is happening. That's where the increase in economic, uh, economic activities happen. But once we have this idea of Geppetto's Clockworks, how do I know that Geppetto's Clockworks is going to pay me back? Right? I knew that Geppetto always paid back his loans, but I don't know whether Geppetto's Clockworks is going to be able to pay back the loan. I've got to figure out some mechanism that I can look at Geppetto's Clockworks and say, oh yeah, they got revenue coming in, they got assets, whatever. So what do we do? We invented the uh, accounting. Right? And in particular, the idea of accounting uh, with uh, assets and liabilities. So I have to come up with a way of figuring out, is Geppetto's Clockworks something that we want to loan money to? Because I've developed banks, okay? I've developed banks during this period. How are they going to figure this out? And so what do we need to do? We need to develop 
some mechanism for accounting in order to figure out whether we can lend money to this, this new thing, this new firm. So if you take, uh, if you major in finance or you major in uh, marketing management, uh, then you have to take two semesters of accounting here. Uh, so why is that? Because, you know, that's the way we do things nowadays. But if this were 1430, you, you wouldn't become an accountant, okay? Um, whereas you need accountants for this period once we start to get to where we've got large entities and they're shipping lots of stuff and they're using credit and banking, then how are we going to ensure that we know what, uh, what's going on with, uh, with them? Um, now, on the, the next piece here in this chapter, uh, starting around page 132, uh, they don't, it's not talking about an institution that develops, but rather than an attitude that develops. They, they say that there's a rising sense of responsibility that develops. And of course, we've talked about this before, that Fritzell and Rosenberg uh, oftentimes are showing historically what Hayek was talking about theoretically, um, and Hayek had that whole chapter on responsibility. They don't mention Hayek when they're talking about this, but they say, here's what happened in the West. It grew rich. Well, what, one of the things that happened in the West was you had this, in this period, 1450 to 1750, this rising sense of individual responsibility, right? And Hayek says, a free society requires more than any other that people be held responsible for their actions. Uh, he says that your station in life, if, if markets are gonna work, if market capital is gonna work, you gotta believe that your station in life is due to your actions, right? And that you think that that's the way the system ought to be. He has that whole discussion in the chapter of responsibility. Well, what happens here in the West is we get this sense of responsibility. In the feudal period, 900 to 1450, you didn't need that, right? You were a serf because your parents were serfs. It wasn't your individual action that caused there to be a serf. Brazil and Rosenberg talk about that, right? We mentioned the fact that they say that uh, one of the things that happened in the feudal period was you didn't have to suffer uh, the, the, the feeling that why you were a serf was because of your own actions, right? There was some, something else created, the system created that. But in, the, but in this period, we get this development of a sense of responsibility, which is necessary for market capitalism to develop, right? Market capitalism develops in the West. It doesn't develop in Sub-Saharan Africa. It doesn't develop in uh, South America. It doesn't uh, you know, develop in Egypt. Uh, it doesn't develop in India, right? Market capitalism develops in the West. And one of the things that happens is, is this uh, rising sense of, uh, of responsibility. Um, and they talk about it being both a religious and a moral sense. You've probably heard uh, about the Protestant work ethic, right? Um, where is this Protestant work ethic coming up, right? It's not coming up in 1310, right? So uh, you have this uh, idea of uh, both a religious and a moral sense that um, you should be responsible for your actions, which is, again, something that's required for market capitalism, uh, for market capitalism to show up. Um, Again, that um, um, the uh, uh, government agencies began to see trade uh, as a uh, mechanism to generate revenue. Right? So your governments uh, saw trade as a revenue source. And so what do they want to do? Right? They want to develop it. Right? They have an incentive to have an expansion of trade. Um, and so uh, this period, 1450 to 1750, rather than wanting to be self-sufficient, which is how you wanted your manor to be, right? That in the feudal system, you had the, the, uh, you know, the towns and the, the manors that were relatively self-sufficient. Uh, we did talk about this, for, uh, during this period, you have the trading cities arising. They then become the dominant force in this period, 1450 uh, to, to 1750. And so during this period by now, 
they start to, the governments want to encourage trade rather than, again, by chartering uh, monopoly trading agencies, by uh, tariffs, but they find mechanisms to want to, uh, to, to have trade. It's also interesting that during this period, you get the rise of the nation state. That is, you get a consolidation of power uh, as nations. Nations start to become the more powerful entities than they were in the, the, during the feudal period. But you have a competition among the nations. And what this competition does is it limits uh, the ability of the national government to interfere in the economy. And of course, why would you, why, why would that be happening? Um, remember that Herzl and Rosenberg say that um, it is, uh, uh, Herzl and Rosenberg say that, that the, it was an anomaly that places that didn't have a very strong government, national government, right, expanded more. And we use the Stuarts as the example, right? The Stuarts in, uh, in uh, England, they weren't very effective at interfering in the economy. And so what happens? The economy grows. Well, if, again, if you read uh, Adam Smith's book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Cause of Wealth and Nations, one of the things that he talks about is the, this, this exact point. He says uh, that, um, if, that this, uh, how do you become a, uh, a powerful entity? You become a powerful a country by becoming wealthy. That's how you become a powerful country. If you have all sorts of wealth, then you can hire, you know, hire armies, and you can have ship, you know, ships, and you know, naval system, etc. if you're wealthier. So if you want to be a powerful country, what do you want to do? You want to have an expanding economy. So all you got to look at is you've got uh, Great Britain, which is, you know, Smith is writing in 1776. Um, what happens? He thinks that if, the, if Great Britain doesn't interfere in the economy, uh, what's going to happen? It's going to get powerful. And of course, that's exactly what happens. If you think about, whoa, who becomes a powerful em empire, right? It is... Britain becomes the em empire, right? The sun never sets on the British Empire, okay? Where it's, but realistically, Great Britain is what? It's just this tiny little island, right? It doesn't have very many resources. Um, it doesn't have this huge population. How in the world is it that Great Britain becomes the, uh, you know, a dominant power becomes an empire uh, and not, uh, you know, and not Mexico? Why did Mexico become an empire? Uh, and the reason is because they developed this idea of limited government, right? This idea of common law and market capitalism is developing here and they become powerful. Notice also du the Dutch do, right? They're not a huge country. They're not a country with lots and lots of resources, but they become an empire. They become a powerful nation. Uh, and why is that? Because they're involved uh, in this development of, of, of market capitalism, and they have less interference in their economy that, uh, than do some, uh, some of the other places. And I do have to, I just keep forgetting to get chalk. Whenever I bring it, remember I brought in a brand new big piece of chalk the other day, and now it's gone. Um, there's clearly not well defined property rights on chalk. <laughs> Uh, all right. Um, so the uh, so so again, um, the, the even though there's the rise of the nation state, it's counterbalanced uh, with this idea that uh, if you don't interfere, you're going to become more competitive, and so you have an incentive for your government to be uh, to be less uh, uh, less uh, in, in interfering. So anyway, in summary, uh, what you have is. A, if you're going to become uh, a, a, you know, if you're, uh, uh, you know, you're Libya, 
and you say, oh my gosh, I got all these people who are demon, I got these you know, people starving to death, uh, I want to move towards market capitalism. Uh, well, you can't just uh, do it out of the blue. You, you need these institutions to develop to get, uh, if you're going to have market capitalism. Again, none of this stuff has to be invented. You don't have to invent, uh, uh, you don't have to invent a legal system uh, with predictable results, right? You don't have to uh, invent how are we going to deal with uh, 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 firms to sink from the individual. How are we going to deal, deal with that? There's, there's already some laws out there that you can borrow from other places. You, you, know, you don't have to invent banks. Uh, uh, you know, J.P. Morgan uh, can show up. But you have to allow that to happen if you have to provide incentives for them to come. You, you have to copy uh, the uh, legal structure of, uh, of uh, the capitalist uh, countries. You have to uh, provide an incentive for GEICO insurance to show up, uh, show up in your country. So that leads us to the next period, which is 1750 to 1880. And this is the Industrial Revolution. This is the arrival of capitalism. Again, Adam Smith's writing, Inquiry to Nature, causes the wealth of nations at the very beginning of this time. He's looking out and he's saying, okay, what's going on here? And what's going on is, uh, in Great Britain, in the colonies, what do you see? You're seeing the develop of market capitalism happening. And that's why uh, this place is rich. Uh, you know, he sees it as rich uh, compared to the rest of the world uh, in 1776, before they even had flip phones. Um, but anyway, um, so this uh, is this period of the Industrial Revolution. And what is that? There was an organizational change. This organizational change and what that organizational change was the factory. That as we start making things uh, through the factory system rather from the artisan apprentice. Prior to 1750, uh, you you know Geppetto was making stuff uh, in his own individual firm, right? He's making it in his own little uh, clockworks uh, store. Um, he's not making thousands of clocks. The way it works in prior to 1750 to 1880, um, what you have is you have the artisan apprentice system. And so what happens is uh, uh, Jimmy Cricket and, uh, uh, and Pinocchio are um, are the 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 uh, sort of the apprentice and Geppetto's showing them how to make stuff, okay? How to make an entire clock. Well, the factory system doesn't work that way. You don't make the whole clock. What happens is the the clocks are going by on a conveyor belt and you're sticking the hand on the clock, right? So you don't learn how to make the whole clock. Um, Adam Smith writes about this in Wealth of Nations, and he is using the pin factory uh, as his example. Um, and he demonstrates that, oh my gosh, you can make pins a lot cheaper if you make them uh, in a factory, uh, and you have into each individual out there just doing one little thing than if you're trying to make the pins by hand. If you try to have a, uh, if you're trying to make pins by having a pin artisan uh, who would then show the uh, the apprentices how to make pins, you wouldn't make nearly as many pins if you have in a factory. But it's also interesting that he has a whole discussion in there about what it, what it will do to affect people's attitudes. Um, that is, if you're working in a factory, uh, that you will see the world differently than if you are an artisan and you're learning a trade. Okay? That is, uh, uh, he, he's concerned a little bit about uh, what will happen uh, to, the, to, to society if people become factory workers versus becoming 
uh, craftsman. And of course, again, he's seeing the factory system at the very beginning, uh, you know, writing in 1776, he's seeing the first 50 years of, uh, of, of the factory system. So there's this uh, primary uh, uh, organizational change. Um, the, uh, the other part of this uh, is that you've got a change in technology. And the, of course, we're used to uh, advances in technology today, um, but in the East, you had two major uh, changes in the technology. One was uh, the use of steam and water power. And two, we had the use of iron and steel. And uh, both of these, both in uh, production and in transportation. That is, prior to the Industrial Revolution, uh, you, didn't, uh, you, you didn't have a need for all sorts of power. Okay? Because I'm not running a factory. But if you're going to be running a factory, then you've got to have power to operate the machinery that's out there making the stuff. Um, now, if you, uh, if you look at Stocks Mill here, it used to be called Stocks Mill, um, you know, the mill downtown here, um, what, it used the power from the river. That was, uh, it, and it was one of the, in fact, it was the, I think we mentioned it was the, first place where they invented white flour was at, right here in Hillsdale. Um, uh, uh, stock, F.W. Stock invented that. But nonetheless, they're, they're using uh, the water power to be able to drive the machinery that's out there making the flour. Today, Stock's Mill is being used to produce Lucky Buck, right? Um, and uh, Lucky Buck, um, Anybody know what you use Lucky Buck for? Really? Um, okay. Uh, Lucky Buck is, you can find it in Cabela's, you can find it in Walmart, uh, all over the place. Um, and what it does is you put it out for uh, deer on the property that you're hunting deer on, and it will uh, have them grow larger antlers. Okay? Um, so uh, uh, it's still being, you know, the mill is still being used to produce a, a material. Not, it's not flour, but it is uh, this uh, uh, stuff that you just put out for the deer. Um, and it uses, actually it sort of uses, if you ever get, get a chance to go on the tour of it, uh, it uses something very similar to the way they used to make flour. Um, but, uh, you know, the idea is today you don't use the river uh, to generate the power to do the thing, right? You use natural gas uh, driven electricity, right? There's a generation of the power that is used to drive the, the, uh, the Lucky Buck uh, down there is, uh, is not steam power any longer, or not water power. But you don't, again, 1450 to 1750, you don't really need steam power. Uh, to generate things because you're still not building stuff in factories. Once I start build, building stuff in factories, I need to have steam and water power. Second is I need iron and steel because in, if I'm making, uh, uh, and, and the uh, primary uh, area that started with this is the textile industry. Right? If you, uh, you know, read about the Industrial Revolution, that's where it started, was in textiles. So if I've got a wooden loom out there and I'm making, you know, 10 shirts, uh, then that will probably work out. If I try and make 10,000 shirts, uh, then I'm going to have a problem, right? Because the looms, wooden loom is going to break down, the tolerance is going to get off. Uh, whereas if I use steel uh, or I use iron, then I can make these things where they can produce lots and lots of the stuff uh, and uh, maintain their tolerances. So the, notice both for the production activity and for transportation. I got steam engines uh, in order to transport goods. If this is 1450, I'm not transporting tons of goods all over the place. Whereas if this is, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later on, 
um, I got to start moving the raw materials into Geppetto's Clockworks. And then I got to start moving the stuff that Geppetto makes out of Geppetto's Clockworks. So I need some mechanism to, uh, uh, to transport the stuff. And so what did we invent? In this period, 1750 to 1880, what do you get? You get the steam engine, right? Uh, you get um, the, the, the iron horse, right? You get uh, steam locomotives. Uh, you get, you know, uh, 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 iron, iron rails or steel rails to move the, to move the trains on. Uh, you get the development uh, across the United States uh, of, the, uh, of the train network, right? Um, you, you don't have that 1450 to 1750 because you don't really need it. But 1750 to 1880, these innovations occur uh, that lead towards uh, a, uh, a development that leads us towards uh, market capitalism. So um, notice that what, what, what happens here is you get a decline in the marginal cost of production. If you go back to uh, the first few weeks of class, uh, what's really going on, right? Is reducing the marginal cost of producing, right? Because now it's way cheaper to make textiles than it did before. Um, rather than having to make this shirt by hand, rather than having this artisan that's out there making the shirt, what do I got? I got a factor that's making thousands of shirts. And, it, and I, got, I got steam power, and I got ways to transport the stuff. So what I did was I significantly reduced the marginal cost of making textiles in particular. So if you were to just go back and draw our demand and supply curves, right? The supply curve was the marginal cost curve. Uh, and we noted that, but what happened is you have the price and quantity. And when we were talking about what things affect the supply curve, we said one of the things that affect the supply curve is technology, right? That's one of the things that changes the marginal cost. Well, Again, we, at, when we did that, we said that the Industrial Revolution can be pictured as a movement of the supply curve to the right, which is exactly what happens here. As the factory happens, factories develop, and we shift that supply curve, what's going to happen? Quantity is going to go up, and price is going to go down. So you don't need closets in 1500. You don't need closets really in 1600. By the time you get to 1800 or 1850, then you start to get closets. It's tend to get a chest of drawers where you have stuff to put your clothes in, right? Textiles are so expensive prior to the factory system that people don't have them. So notice what, 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 what went on here is that we produce something that the poor could use, that the uh, average person could use, and we shifted that supply curve out and we drove down the price and we increased the quantity. That's what's happening in the factory system. And again, it starts in textiles, but it moves through uh, to all sorts of goods where today, probably everything that you're using today, which is a product, uh, got made in a factory, uh, unless you um, you know, you, you really want to have something really, really cool, right? This was handmade, like your sandwich. Right? Um, uh, you know, th th that's why they call it handmade, right? Because they want, you know, okay, this ain't factory, this ain't subway, right? This is handmade. Um, and so, uh, you know, it may, so today you're willing to pay more for something like that just because you want the coolness of it somehow. But if this is 1800 or this is 1830, you're not worried about that, right? You want to have things uh, uh, made with the factory system. So uh, you, get these, uh, you get this organizational change and you get this change in the, in, in the technology. So um, once you got all this uh, additional, um, actually, by the way, I was just thinking, you know, I, I told you that I gave you the talk in, Wednesday, you know, I left and drove to Wheeling, to West Virginia, and gave a talk at the uh, Wheeling Jesuit University. Um, and there was about like 150 students or something there. Um, I just don't get the joke, right? They, you know, 
like I used, you know, I used where I was talking about, I said, well, uh, you know, this isn't rocket surgery, okay? They don't get it. Like I had somebody come after me and say, well, you know, it's really rocket science. <laughs> it's brain surgery. I go, I know, that's the joke. That's right. <laughs> um, so, glad to be back. You know, so. But anyway, <laughs> uh, but anyway um, so once this, this happened is that you start to get, uh, just as we had, remember from 1450 to 1750, what did we say? You got urbanization because you had, you know, people moving to the trading cities. The trading cities uh, made it so that there was more production. Uh, you get a very similar thing here. Now you get urbanization happening because you've got this increase, uh, in, increase in uh, econ economic activity. And uh, it's sort of interesting that um, what, what's going on in the, if you look at what's going on in the agricultural sector, um, you get an increase in productivity there. But what happens here is you get displaced agricultural workers. I don't need so many agricultural workers as I did prior. Now, if you just, you know, just even just driving uh, you know, just drive around Hillsdale County, uh, what's going on today, right? Well, what's going on is they're plowing, right? And they're planting. Um, and what you'll see is you don't see a whole bunch of people uh, with little hoes that are digging up the ground and then planting the seeds, right? They got 18-row combines that are, you know, you got one person driving the, um, get where, the song uh, uh, John Deere, John Deere Green, right? It's a country song about John Deere Green. Um, there's also a, uh, a takeoff on it uh, called uh, uh, Pretty Pink Tractor. Um, yes, you <laughs> Yeah, so you, get on YouTube and look up Pretty Pink Tractor. It's, it's pretty good. But anyway, um, so I don't need lots and lots of people to be out there uh, picking the, you know, uh, you know, uh, planting or anything else. So with all those people that used to work in the, you know, on the, on the ground in, uh, you know, 1790, right? Uh, they're not there anymore. They're being displaced. So where are they going? They're going into the urbanization, and they're going into the factories. So the factories become an outlet for the displaced agricultural workers uh, as we move towards the Industrial Revolution. So the Industrial Revolution that's going on here is a movement where I've got increased productivity in the factory system, I've got a shift of the supply curve out to the right, I've got prices falling, I've got output rising, now it's now the, the, the poor can afford uh, to have clothing that they didn't, weren't able to do before at the very beginning of this, the factory system moves into all sorts of uh, all sorts of entities, so that you guys can now have pens and pencils and and backpacks and everything else that you couldn't have had if we didn't have the factory system. Uh, and we got increase in agricultural productivity, which means I don't need so many people. Um, in fact, uh, you see that going on today. Um, in uh, I was just listening because I'm driving between here in Wheeling, West Virginia and back, right? Um, and so I'm you know, listening to the radio and all things considered and all that stuff. Um, uh, but uh, one of the things that they were mentioning is that um, Walmart is starting to use robots uh, to clean, up, clean the floors and you know, pick up spills and to uh, count uh, you know, the, uh, the inventory and all that rather than having individuals do that. So robots are, are replacing uh, you know, skilled labor, or un, excuse me, unskilled labor. Maybe it is skilled to, able to go down the shelves and figure out what's on there. But nonetheless, um, the robots are replacing labor in Walmart, okay? Um, of course, I'm thinking as an economist, oh, I wonder if this has to do with 
an increase in the minimum wage or a threatened increase in the minimum wage or the fact that if I'm Walmart, I got to now provide health insurance for all my employees and so I've got to pay them the $7.75 an hour plus now it's getting more and more expensive to do this and so what I do, I don't have to pay the robot the uh, health insurance, right? Uh, and so, uh, you know, sort of a nerdy thing to be thinking about while I'm driving along, but nonetheless, um, what was happening here in the West was, as these uh, workers are displaced in the agriculture sector, there's a place for them to go, right? And the place for them to go is the factories. Notice, again, as I mentioned, China is going through this very thing today, right? China has cities with 20 million people in them. Uh, and uh, lots and lots of those people came from the agricultural sector, uh, just as happened in the, this period, 1750 to 1880, in the United States. China's going through it much more quickly today. All right, so for um, Monday, what we'll do is we will uh, we'll certainly finish this chapter, and we'll move into the next chapter is... <coughs> 1880 to 1913, the rise of the corporation. We are not going to spend much time on the chapter on science, right? They've got a chapter on science. We'll just sort of summarize that, just like we did uh, in um, the, uh, uh, or the uh, Constitution of Liberty. That chapter will just be like a summary chapter. All right? So take a look and try to get yourself over the weekend through. Uh, the chapter that goes to uh, 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 1880-1913.